Okay, let's start. Hi, I'm Bruce Payette. I work. Uh, oh, you don't see me. Well, wow. yeah. That's better? Okay. Hi, I'm still Bruce Payat. <laughs> and I work for Microsoft. I worked on, on PowerShell since before there was a PowerShell. Um, and today we're going to look at uh, one of the subtle aspects of the PowerShell language, scoping. Uh, or uh, when you're looking for your variables, you say, where did that come from? So we'll start with some definitions. Uh, then we'll look a little bit at the engine structure. Uh, so you can figure out where pieces are. We'll go through some of the basic scoping uh, rules. Uh, we'll look at some scenarios and then touch on scoping in classes and then finally scoping in APIs. And this, is, this talk actually came out of a discussion I had back at Microsoft where some of the people on the team said, you know, we don't really understand scoping all that well, so could you do a talk on scoping? And then I've had two or three talks, two or three dis discussions since then. Uh, where people are uh, trying to do things and they don't quite understand how scoping works. So hopefully this will clarify uh, rather than confuse people. So definitions. Scoping. Um, I was going to use the Wikipedia definition of scoping, but it goes on for pages. Um, so I made one up. And scoping is the mechanism by which named entities like variables and functions are resolved in a programming language. Uh, there are two major types of scoping. There's what's called dynamic scoping. <laughs> Uh, where the variables are resolved by looking up, looking at the dynamic call stack, the series of calls that have been made in the program. Um, this is almost never used anymore. Uh, like 30 years ago, Lisp, for example, had, had dynamic scoping, but it's very, very rarely used now. Uh, the reason that we're using it is that's what shells use. Shells use the equivalent of, the, of dynamic scoping. Even Bash uh, and the Unix shells use the equivalent of dynamic scoping, where the variables from the caller's context, well, in, in their case, the variables of the caller's context are copied into the child context. Um, so PowerShell's normal scoping behavior is dynamic uh, with one modification. Uh, normally in dynamic scoping, when you set a variable, you look up the scope chain, find the variable, and set the variable in the scope where it exists. We don't do that. We set the variable in the current scope all the time. And again, that emulates the behavior of shells. Uh, the other major variant of for scoping is static scoping, where the variable locations are resolved at compile time. So you look at the lexical, lexical structure of the program, and you can figure out which variables are visible at any given, given scope, where scopes are based on lexical blocks. Uh, and finally, since I said it was uh, dynamic scoping was based on the call stack, the call stack is the tree of active objects. So every active function uh, in a list, or in other words, nested function calls. So a little bit about the PowerShell engine structure. Everybody, everybody's familiar with the run space? Yeah. So the run space is, is composed of a bunch of major components. And very early on in PowerShell, these were actually discrete components. Uh, we aggregated them together to make up a run space uh, at one point because it was too confusing. Um, so there's the, the session state, extend type system, serialization, there's a parser and language. Uh, the one that we're really concerned with, though, is session state because session state is where all the, all the action happens. It's all about session state. So the session state is this uber object that was created to bring together all the various pieces. PowerShell has more uh, scoped objects than a traditional programming language. We have things like drives and so forth. And so we created this uber object that just is a container for all of the uh, scopable entities. So basic scoping, things that are scoped in PowerShell, Variables are scoped, functions are scoped, uh, drives, which is a unique thing for PowerShell. Commands are scoped. Um, that's a little weird for people to think about because it's really done by import module. So you can originally import module only import it into either the module scope or the global scope. Um, in version three, we added a new scope qualifier option to import module that allows you to import commandlets into a local scope. So in that way, you can have, you can have uh, one function that's using a particular version of a module and all the functions that are defined in that module calling another function that imports its local copy of a different version of the, of the same module. And so you can have the same module used in different scopes uh, within the same program. Um, it's a little complicated. Uh, 
but it does allow you to do uh, some fairly sophisticated things. Things that aren't scoped, providers. Uh, we probably could have scoped providers, but we just didn't. Um, it seemed like too much work at the time. And then the environment is not scoped because that is a process-wide uh, entity. So when are scopes created? Scopes are created on function activations. So anytime you call a function or a script or a script block or load a module, you're creating a new scope. Um, under the covers, everything is really just a script block. So a function is a script block with a name. Um, a module is, well, a script block with a slightly different kind of name. Uh, but it's really all about script blocks. Uh, something that uh, I've seen people get confused about is that script blocks are not equivalent to lexical blocks. And Tobias actually, uh, in his session, second session yesterday, was talking about how you could take for each object the uh, commandlet with begin, process, and end, and then turn it into a function. And the function was a great deal faster. And the reason that's true is that each of the blocks in the for each object case is a function. And so you have the overhead as a function call. Uh, but in the, uh, w when you bring them as begin, process, and end blocks into a function itself, there they're just running as part of the language. So you don't have that, that overhead of a function call. You don't have a new scope being created. Um, uh, you don't have the overhead of setting up args and so forth. And that makes it a great deal faster. So the scope stack. Um, so the scope stack is a linked list of, of activations. If you look at this diagram, going from the bottom to the top, uh, function three would see all of the variables A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, if, you were if it was looking for, say, A, then it would look in its parent scope. It's not there. It looked in its parent's parent scope. It's not there. Finally, it hits the global scope, and it, it's there. We'll quickly look at some code. So I have a little routine for formatting my stack. Certainly, Jeffrey. Better? Um, so here we have exactly the example. We have a function foo that calls bar, bar calls baz, baz calls buzz. Um, we initialize the, the variables x, y, and z to global, and then in each of the enclosing scopes, we set one of the variables. Now we'll run this. We'll try and run just this. And so the scope is dumped, or the stack is dumped from the top to the bottom. So buzz doesn't have any local variables. Uh, it looks up the scope stack for its z uh, and gets three. It looks for y. Looking for Z, it finds it in the Baz scope. Looking for Y, it finds it in the bar scope. Looking for Foo, it finds it in the X scope. Uh, remember when I said everything was a script block? So you have a script block at the top level because that's the, the command that you typed gets turned into a script block and then evaluated. Uh, and so finally the output is X equals 1, Y equals 2, and Z equals 3. Okay, so I said it was a, a linked list or a stack. I actually lied. Um, it turns out that in PowerShell, because you have multi, every, every active function has a scope associated with it. And if you have a pipeline with multiple functions in it, uh, foo pipes to bar, pipes to baz, each of those is a function, each of those has an active scope. And so there's really a tree of scopes um, and, and uh, they sort of get popped on and off the execution context. Uh, depending on where you're executing, but they're all they're all concurrently active scopes. Uh, actually, careful when I say concurrent means not doesn't mean that they're running at the same time, but they do exist all at the same time, and that allows you to do things like uh, initialize a counter in the begin block, uh, set it in the process block, and then emit it in the end block um, because it has to maintain that context. And this is actually a bug. Uh, uh, early on in version one, we had this bug where we weren't building a tree; we were building a strict stack. And where people were going, why am I seeing the variables from upstream in my context? And getting very confused. So we had to change the, uh, the structure. So here's dynamic scoping and functions in, in the diagram. This comes right out of my book. Um, here we have function two calling function one. Uh, function one prints out a string, x is x and y is y. So when function one looks to find x, it doesn't find it in the local context. It goes up to the caller's context, which is the function, uh, function one, gets it from function one, 
uh, it looks to find y. It's not in function one. It finds it in the global scope. And let's extend this now to scripts. Scripts simply introduce a new distinguished scope. And so you can use a scope qualifier to say, uh, skip all of my callers uh, stack entries and go to the nearest enclosing scope or stack, uh, designated stack scope. And so we see in this case, we have a, sc a script that calls one and one calls two. And uh, in the, uh, the block, um, it's actually referring to the script scope uh, dollar B. Uh, and so you get return, uh, returns 120, 30, 4,000, uh, picking it up from each of the respective scopes. So that's fairly straightforward. It's just a distinguished scope. Um, but there are, so we, so we just talked about the, the script scope modifier. There's several modifiers. There's global, which is fairly straightforward. I think everybody, everybody's familiar with the global scope modifier. Everybody's familiar with the script scope modifier. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a module scope modifier. Um, script uh, uh, doubles for the module scope modifier. Um, dollar using, which is sort of a scope modifier, but for, it's used for remoting, copying things from the, the local context into the remote context. But there's a set of other things called scoped item options. Um, you can mark a variable as private, so it won't be visible in child activations. You can mark a variable as being all scope, so that variable will be present in all scopes. Uh, it can be read-only, that's fairly straightforward, and it can be constant. So let's look at some quick examples. So scoped item option, this is basically the same example we looked at with the distinction that now we're marking uh, the variable as being private. So let's see what the stack looks like. Right. And so this time, you don't see the variable y because it's marked as private. It's not visible outside of that function. And so when, when the deep, most deeply nested function, buzz, goes to look up y, it doesn't see the y that's in bar. It sees the y that's in the global scope. Um, and this is, if you have functions where you will want to, want to avoid contaminating the child scope, this is where you can use private. Has anybody used private? Oh. Somebody, that's good. <laughs> Three people, yay, it's a success. Yes? That would be a nice idea, but no. <laughs> you have to mark each one as being private. Um, if we had variable declarations, we could maybe do that, but we don't. So read only. We're going to create a variable with the value read only. We'll try and set it and then display it. Right. So you try and set it. Cannot overwrite x because it's read only or constant. Uh, it is in fact read only. We just saved an error message, and the original value hasn't changed. So, uh, but but read only is is fungible you can actually force an overwrite on read-only. So now it gets set, right? So if you really want to change the value of something. And most of our variables are, are read, like most of the uh, runtime variables are read-only. But there's another variant constant. Right, and I'm going to call this variable annoying because it will be annoying. Oh, that was terrible. Hit the wrong one. Let's try this again. Actually, this is going to give you an error, right? Um, so I, because I already ran that line, I can't actually set the variable because it's constant. So I even even doing calling set variable with the option constant to make it a value is not going to work. Um, I call that variable annoying because. Even if it's, even with force, it won't overwrite it. Constant is constant. I'll try and remove the variable. And it still fails. So if you declare a variable as being constant, it's constant. It's, it exists for the duration of that session. The only way to get rid of it is to exit. Uh, and originally, we were going to make all of our system variables constant. 
but that seemed a bit too draconian. And I don't, don't think constant gets used very much. I don't know, has anybody used constant? Ah, did it cause problems? Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> oh yes, and then there's all scope. So normally variables are created in the local scope, right? Um, if you mark a variable all scope, that same variable exists in all scopes, which means that it's, if you write it in the local scope, then it's, it's, it's the same variable in every scope. In fact, what happens is it gets copied into each scope. And so if I do a, a, a nested set using the script block, um, it will in fact change the value of that variable. Right, so it doesn't get changed. Um, and a lot of the PowerShell variables are, are marked as all scope. Um, again, I don't know if anybody would use it for anything else. So scoping session state and modules. I said session state is, is where all the, all the action happens. Uh, in fact, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a session state object and a module uh, because a module contains Commands, functions, variables, everything—everything everything that's essentially in a in a session state object is also contained in a module. So modules are really just wrappers around session state. Um, one of the things that that uh, because it's a session state object, the session state object contains the call stack. So each module has its own call stack. Um, items are resolved in the module's call stack, and then it goes to the global scope. Um, in fact, session state objects are are uh, can be linked together just like scopes. Um, but in practice, we only use uh, one link. We link to the global scope. Um, in fact, they could be linked to nothing. So we had some, some ideas about uh, having completely isolated execution environments that didn't touch global, uh, but we didn't do anything with that. Um, having nested chains and module, but we didn't do that. Uh, the, the code is still there, but it hasn't been really used for anything. Uh, beyond linking to, to the global state. So here's more or less, this is actually not a great diagram, um, but it shows you that there is a global module table, so all modules, modules are unique by path name, um, and so all of the modules are stored in the global module table, uh, and then this, this diagram shows the, the linkages where you export uh, content from one module to another, um, and then everything links back to the global state. So uh, a brief digression, because we're an open source project now, it seems like it would be worth spending a tiny bit of time on looking at the structure of our code. Should be readable, yes. <coughs> so this is the root. If you uh, sync our GitHub repository, this is what you'll see in the root directory. Source code is in source. The code that we want to take a look at, we want to look at the engine code. All of the engine code is stored in the DLL system.management.automation or SMA as it's popularly known. Um, it's broken up into uh, a bunch of different areas, help, the help subsystem, logging subsystem, and so forth. Uh, the, the thing that we're most interested in is the core engine itself, which is under the directory engine. Take a look at the session state. So session state is actually split into a, a group of files. Um, it's a set of partial classes spread across the various files uh, just because it's, it contains a lot of stuff. Um, so this is the session state, basic session state object. And you can see that it links to its parent, uh, 
execution context, people may have used that. Uh, have you ever used the execution context API from script? Um, it, it corresponds. Uh, Alexander sort of waved a little bit. Yeah, so execution context is a, it has a ton of useful functionality. It's essentially equivalent to what you get inside the commandlet, uh, commandlet APIs. Um, so taking a look at these classes, you can see all the how all the various pieces are implemented. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on them. You want to see a scope? So the session state, the scope object exists in a file called session state scope. Not a huge surprise. That's not what I wanted to do. So, and again, you have this linkage, right? So just like in session state scope is a, a chain of scope uh, objects, uh, modules are a chain of module objects. So that's basically the, the structure of uh, the basic structure of, of the session state source code. So if you're trying to do any work uh, in our repository, you have a, a, some some idea of where things are. Uh, so the most common time when you're actually dealing with with explicit scoping is with with the ampersand and dot operator. Um, they run dot runs in the current scope. Um, it uh, uh, ampersand runs in the new scope. It can be applied to scripts. It can be applied to functions, or it can be applied directly to script blocks. Uh, even when you're dotting, there's still a certain uh, amount of stuff. So you see nothing gets printed out, even though dollar args is set, because there are certain variables that are always set in a in a in an invocation. So it doesn't really matter. This uh, dollar args, dollar input. There are a set of variables that are always set in uh, a script lock invocation, even if you're dot sourcing it. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's faster to use the language constructs than it is to use. Uh, script blocks, even when you're dot sourcing, there's still a certain amount of overhead preparing the runtime environment. Um, you can also use ampersand to run in a module scope. We'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, so one another scenario, invoke command and invoke expression. Invoke command mostly is used for doing remoting, but you can also use it to invoke a, a, a script block locally, uh, and it always runs in a, in a nested scope. Um, invoke expression, on the other hand, uh, runs, which parses and runs arbitrary code, executes in the current scope. Uh, and as always, don't use it. If, if you ever find yourself using invoke expression, you're almost certainly wrong. Uh, think hard about using ampersand or some other tool, uh, but just really try and avoid, avoid invoke expression. Uh, it's just a way of getting uh, code injection uh, exploits in your code. Oh. All right, so here's a little example. Uh, most of the time, people wouldn't be doing uh, this type of assignment. But I said x equals 1. I evaluate my string. I did the wrong thing again. There we go. Right, so it does actually change it. So that's invoke expression. Invoke expression, invoke command invokes in the nested scope, invoke expression invokes in the current scope. It's another variable, uh, playing with the call stack. Um, 
So you looked at all scope, all scope, you can set it in the current context and it's set in all of the scopes where, where it's defined. Um, normally when variables are, are defined or assigned with the assignment statement, they're assigned in the current uh, context. But it is possible to uh, either get the variable from another scope using get variable or setting it explicitly with set variable with a scope depth modifier. Um, this only works for variables, so you couldn't, for example, fiddle with functions. You can't set a function in an enclosing scope, but you can access and fiddle with variables. So get variable, get variable will return you, get variable will return you the variable object. The variable object uh, contains the value property, which you can then write, and that modifies the, uh, the value of that variable regardless of where it's instantiated. So we'll run a little, basically the same example again, who are Baz. Um, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the variable y, which is defined, the function buzz is going to get the variable y, which is defined in the bar uh, scope, and then modify it. I must not run the wrong thing again. Right, so when we're dumping the bar scope, we can see that it's actually been modified. So the, the child, the, the, the called function modified the caller's environment, um, which in Ruby people have a term called monkey patching where you go off and you patch your caller's environment. So that's kind of this thing. And then like with, uh, likewise with set variable, uh, you can avoid the whole com complexity of, down, uh, of grabbing the variable reference and then modifying it uh, simply by doing a set variable with uh, dash scope one, which sets it in the caller scope. Uh, again, has anybody ever used that? Anybody know that existed? Yeah, good. I forgot about that till Jeffrey mentioned to mentioned it to me, but like an hour ago. So it's somewhat obscure. Um, yeah, and and now for uh, some of the more obscure stuff. Uh, Dynamic modules, so dynamic modules uh, are uh, an in-memory only module created with the new module commandlet. And by default, they're just objects. They aren't added to the, the uh, global module table. They can be added to the module table um, by piping into import module. So here's the code to define the module. So we now have a module object. Um, you'll notice the name, normally the name of the module is gonna be the, the, uh, uh, the base name of the path. Uh, here, because it doesn't exist in the file system, it gets a, uh, a dynamic module and a GUID. So the dynamic modules are unique. Modules have to have a unique name. Right, so we exported two functions, we can call them, set scale, right? And the scale triples nine to 27. Um, this is where we can also use uh, ampersand and dot with the module object that we got to reach into the, reach inside the module and manipulate uh, context in the modules, manipulate state in the context of the module. Um, So here it didn't change it because I'm using ampersand. So it's being executed uh, in a, a nested or local scope within the module. If I use dot, now it's modified it to 18. The core scenario for doing this is primarily debugging. It allows you to reach into and inspect the internals of a module. Uh, it's not something that you would use uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as a programming practice, but it does allow you to look at and manipulate the state of the module. So the next logical, or the next extrapolation from a dynamic module is a closure. Um, flip back to my deck. So closure is a script block that has uh, a session state attached. In, in practice, all script blocks have a session state attached. They, they have their execution environment uh, 
attached to them all the time. Uh, what's different about a closure is that it gets um, a it gets its own session state, um, and it lets you do things like create uh, counters, uh, generator functions. Right, so I'm going to define a function that this, what this function does is it doesn't it's not a counter it generates counters right so it'll return a closure that when you invoke it will count through the series of numbers again All right so I've defined it and now let's Right, so I'm going to create a, I'm going to create a counter here, and then I'm going to call it a couple of times. All right, so two, three. So every time I call that, right. So the the the. Counter is, a, is stored in the, the counter variable is stored in the, the attached module, um, so it has it has state associated with it. Uh, is there any if if you look at uh, uh, the simplex module, simplex module one of the examples uses uh, uh, closures uh, to manage state within the the DSL. Oh yes, the other thing I can do is. I can also assign that that close script block to a function, and then I can just call a function. Right. So this is a way of building functions that have pre-existing state. Closure closures are they're useful and they're, they're definitely useful. Um, the scenarios are tend tend to be a little bit obscure. Um, but uh, they're quite powerful when when you do need it. And then the final variation on uh, all of this stuff is um, uh, custom objects, right? So again, it's new module. We'll build you a new module, but instead of returning a module object, it'll return a PS custom object. And so in this uh, in this object, we're going to um, create one variable within the module and then two functions. And we're going to export all of those members, but as custom object. So what happens as custom object is it doesn't return a module object. It returns a custom object where the functions and uh, the exported members are become properties on the object, on the, on the return custom object. So now I have call it custom object. And it has it's exposing one pro I, I said export that variable X so X is now exported as a property on the object uh, you can see the properties that I define the function I define showing up as members Because I exposed x as a variable. I can, uh, uh, I can set the scale by simply setting the variable. Um, this involves a certain level of trickiness. Uh, people are familiar with, uh, so uh, uh, new module member, or new, or add member rather, uh, adds a member. To the uh, to the on object, um, you're familiar with no properties and script script methods and script properties and so forth. Uh, custom types introduce a new type of, of property called a PS variable property, which and this is the only place that it's actually used. So if you take a look at it, it's a PS variable property, where the property in the object is actually backed by a variable. So setting the the property on the object. Um, rather than just setting a, a data value, it actually changes the value of the variable in the modules context. So that's custom object. So scoping and classes. Uh, how many people have used classes so far? 
a few. Um, so classes use lexical, lexical scoping, which is a fairly radical idea given that all of the rest of PowerShell is dynamically scoped. It also has a number of other restrictions that are intended to make for more reliable code. Uh, variables must be assigned before they're used, and this is detected at compile time, not at runtime. So with, uh, with strict mode, you can, if, if you set strict mode on, then you can get an error if you try and use an uninitialized variable, but that won't happen until runtime. In classes, if you try and use an uninitialized variable, it will give you an error message immediately. It'll give you an error message in the editor. Um, and then to reference instance variables and methods, you must prefix it with dollar this. So let's take a look at a class. So here's my here's the scaling thing again done as a class uh, to get an idea of, of some of the, the the checking features, right? Say I mistype that, right? Immediately I get an error saying that this variable is not assigned in this method. If I forget to put dollar dollar this. I get an error as well, right? So this means that you'll never end up with an uninitialized value, or an, you're extremely unlikely to end up with, a, with an incorrectly named variable in a class. So that makes them rather more reliable. Um, so we'll just run the, the sample. Right, and so we have a scaler. Um, methods in classes have return types. Um, I, I could have set this to be integer and restricted it to integer, but I wanted it to be polymorphic. So uh, the output type is object, and I don't give a, I don't constrain the uh, the value to be scaled. Um, also using the, the the new new object syntax, uh, which is definitely preferable over using the new object commandlet. It's faster, uh, it is less error prone. If you wanna pass in an array, uh, if you're using new object and you have a, have a constructor that takes an array as a parameter, you actually have to put a, a prefix comma in front of it, otherwise it gets passed as an array of multiple parameters. That doesn't happen with new object. So I would recommend that if you are, uh, if you can stick to PowerShell 5, then use the new the, the double goal and new syntax for newing up objects is faster and it's more reliable. Is there any questions at this point? Yes. Let's say I have a complex and you add number to add like a few um, methods to it. Mm -hmm. right. um, how does it compare to using um, it's lighter weight. Uh, the the new module has custom object. There are things you can do to. Uh, you can have hidden members. You can do a lot more sophisticated stuff uh, with uh, as custom object. You can do things that you can't even do in classes because it does have hidden members. Um, but the overhead is significant because it has a session state object with it. So. Uh, just taking a PS custom object and then adding members to it is much more lightweight than doing the as custom object. Um, so if you're if you're doing if you have a scenario where you're creating tens of thousands of objects, uh, as custom object is probably not your best solution unless it, um, unless you actually need its capability. Uh, you're better off with uh, using add member. Anybody else? Okay, uh, so let's switch gears a little bit and look at APIs. Um, this has come up recently in a couple of discussions where people are trying to write commandlets that uh, monitor script blocks, for example, and they run into trouble because they get, well, they're getting into nested execution and so forth. Um, so first off, we'll look at the, the PowerShell API. Uh, Ask again, who's, who's used the PowerShell API? One, no, oh, okay. Uh, PowerShell API is primarily intended to be used uh, programmatically, um, but if you were playing with run spaces, you can also use it in, in um, uh, uh, in script. Uh, 
effectively. Uh, and you can have you, you can do execution in the current run space. Normally, uh, PowerShell will execute in a separate run space. Uh, here, with this option, you can run it in the current run space. And let's see what happens when we run this. Sucks to be me. Double X. I can make a triple X like a movie. Right. And so it sets it. So by default, uh, when you add a script to a PowerShell object, and then invoke it, it invokes in the current scope. If for some reason you want to invoke in a child scope, um, it has an overload that gives you uh, a value you can set, uh, use local scope. The terminology is profoundly confusing. Use local scope to a lot of people, it means use the current scope, which is the local scope, as opposed to use new scope. Um, so it's an, it was an unfortunate choice of, of terminology but use local scope means use new scope, as opposed to the current local scope. Um, and we'll run this. And it didn't change the value because it was being run in the local scope. Oh, I'm still putting the wrong variable. Okay. I'm setting the wrong variable too. I didn't get an error that time when I was setting X because it was being executed in a local scope. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. So it didn't change it. So the, the run space API, the, one of the downsides of the run space API um, is that it doesn't take a script block. It takes a string. So you can take a script block, turn it into a string, pass it to the API where it'll turn it back into a script block. Um, that's fairly inefficient. Um, and it turns out that there is an obscure API that will actually allow you to invoke a script block directly in, in your choice of a current scope or the child scope. Uh, and that's on an execution context. So I said, who's used execution context? This is one of the, one of the times where you would use this set of APIs. Uh, so we're creating a script block. Uh, let me go and change my X's again. All right, so I'm, I'm setting the value of X. I'm creating a script block that simply takes a parameter which creates a local variable. Um, And I'm going to invoke it, and I'm passing in. So you can see the, the signature of the method is here. And here's our friend, friendly neighborhood use local scope API again. Uh, so if that's true, then it'll invoke in a nested scope. So let's execute that. Right. So it didn't, it, uh, didn't change that value. It, should, it would be one, two, three if it changed it. And now let's call the same thing again, but we'll use the current scope. And this time it changes it, right? And so uh, you may wonder what, what's so exciting about this API. After all, you can just dot the script block directly. Um, this is primarily intended to be used from commandlets. Uh, and one, one, uh, one important thing to understand is that commandlets don't create a scope. Right. Scopes are created by functions, scripts, and so forth, but not commandlets, which is why commandlets like for each object and so forth can don't have problems with uh, changing things in the current scope. Um, they, they execute the script block in the current scope. 
without this API, uh, this invoke script API, it's, it's impossible to write the equivalent of a for each object command line. Uh, but by using it, you can. And there's actually a, uh, um, a, a GitHub issue on this uh, that, that there wasn't this API, but there actually is an API that does, does what the issue requester wanted. It's just really obscure. Um, it might be better to, to migrate the functionality and create an overload in the PowerShell API that takes a script block. So that's basically, I'm out of time too. Excellent. I, I, I'm right on time. So summary, uh, PowerShell, pardon? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Oh, well, uh, going to my summary anyway. Um, but I'm out of sand. Oh, okay. Um, so PowerShell uses dynamic scoping. Uh, this is unusual for a programming language. Um, most of the time, uh, when things are working right, it doesn't matter. It just kind of works the way you want. Uh, it can introduce false coupling, where uh, content in the caller scope leaks into uh, the child scope. Um, and so it's good to have an understanding of how that basically works. Um, and uh, it's harder, I think, for programmers to get used to it than uh, people who, are, who don't have a programming background because most languages are lexically scoped and so they have uh, expectations that uh, if, I if I set a variable inside a while loop, then it's a local variable to that while loop and things like that. Uh, and that, that's not true. Um, the core data structures all live in session state. So if you're trying to figure out exactly how something works, uh, now that it's open source, you can actually go into the source code and take a look and see what's going on. Um, scoping affects a lot of things, uh, functions and scripts, script blocks, modules, dynamic closures, pretty much everything that uh, um, has to do with execution gets impacted by scoping in, in some way. And then finally, PowerShell classes use lexical scope. Uh, the, all that they see, you, you can use the scope qualifiers for global, but otherwise, they never see the caller scope chain. Um, uh, I strongly encourage people to use classes because of the, the checks against uninitialized variables. Uh, it's more reliable. Uh, I think uh, Tobias mentioned that the return statement actually returns things. Um, it isn't, so return will return something in, in a normal function, but everything else gets returned too. Um, uh, I think I was going to show. So here I have a return type. I don't have a return type invalid, right? Because it knows I haven't specified the return type. I call the return statement in, in here and it gives me an error. Likewise. There's no, no return. So the, it does, the, the uh, compiler does flow analysis to make sure that if, you if you're supposed to return something, uh, then all of the branches actually have a return statement. So you're guaranteed to do a return. Uh, if you're not supposed to return anything, then if you try and return something, uh, it will give you an error. Um, so there's, there's a lot more rigorous checking. It's much more similar to programming language style checking than uh, sort of Lucy shell scripting style checking. Uh, so again, I encourage you to investigate uh, classes. Uh, the other thing is that method dispatch in classes is, quite a, is significantly faster than um, calling a function. And so you can use, rather than a function, you could, for example, define a static method and invoke that, and it would be quite a bit faster uh, than using the equivalent function. Um, as appropriate, right? If you have something that's very performance sensitive, then using ma static methods is a way to get uh, additional performance. But if you make your code much harder to read or harder to understand, uh, then it's probably not a great solution. And eventually, we'll, you know, hopefully, eventually, we'll get the function dispatch up to the more or less same speed as uh, the static method dispatch. Uh, but right now, it's so. Right now, it's significantly slower to call a function than it is to call a method. Uh, that may change in future. <laughs>
And so that's it. Um, you have your 15 minute break, grab a coffee, all that good stuff, and questions. Yes? Um, so in, in a DSC configuration, um, you have begin, process, and end inside a module. Um, the, the same set of rules apply. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what exactly to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you, have, you have to use using inside of a configuration for uh, the, the script resource um, where you want to pull local variables across. That's, that's pretty much the only example, right? Uh, normally you wouldn't use scope qualifiers or any of that kind of stuff because it all gets executed. The, the, what gets sent to the remote end is MOF and the MOF calls the providers. Um, there's not typically any code in the MOF unless you use uh, the script resource. And there, if you want to have a variable copied from the, just like in invoke command, if you want to have a variable copied from the caller's context or the uh, local context copied to the remote context, um, then you have to use dollar using. It's actually a little bit weirder because what happens is the uh, the using variables get serialized into the MOF. So if you, if you take a look at the MOF uh, that contains a script resource with dollar using, you'll find that uh, that content is serialized into the MOF um, and then gets evaluated at, uh, when the, the MOF gets applied. Anyone else? Yes? Sorry, just saying that when you, in addition to that, to that rule, if they were using the MOF, they seem to remember certain objects have been serialized. Yeah, the, well, they, they serialize using the PowerShell serializer. So there are certain types of objects that, that won't serialize uh, if you're using using. Um, yeah, no, that's not going to work. No, it doesn't work very well. By design. Yeah. So. Um, yes, way in the back. Correct. Um, what kind of are there concerns? Uh, will the main command like or Yeah, so so uh, it's only C sharp, it's compiled commandlets. Right? Compiled commandlets because they use the the normal uh, .NET execution stack don't have a local they have they have their own activation record. They don't have the equivalent of a of a PowerShell activation record associated with them. So they're always being executed in the current scope. And that's what makes things like for each object uh, possible. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Okay, well then, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And. Uh, <laughs>